Hi and welcome to this session about practical experience with Linux AB upgrades. My name is Leona Navi, I'm a senior software engineer at Consulco Group and an open source enthusiast. Consulco Group is a services company specializing in embedded Linux and open source software. My colleagues and I have experience in hardware and software build, design, development and training services. Furthermore, we have numerous upstream contributions through the years to very popular open source projects, including U-Boot, the Linux kernel, uh, Yocto, Open Embedded, Buildroot, Automotive Grade Linux, and a lot of solutions for um, software over the air up upgrades. Actually, the core uh, topic for this presentation. Consulco Group is based in San Jose, California with engineering presence worldwide. I have the privilege to be working remotely from my beautiful hometown of Plovdiv, Bulgaria. Because of this, this talk is pre-recorded, so please feel free to ask questions in the chat while you're watching it. The agenda of this talk uh, focuses on several topics. First, we'll start with uh, discussing strategies and open source solutions for updating embedded Linux devices. For the past several years, I have been actively using the Yocto project. Um, so the majority of the examples will be about Yocto and open embedded. We'll focus on two particular solutions for AB upgrades, Mender and Rauk. We'll also discuss a combined strategy for integration containers with these uh, AB upgrades. Finally, we'll wrap it up with some conclusions. There are many things that we should consider when we uh, discuss software upgrades. Are there any limitations of the disk space? Are there any limitations of the network bandwidth? Uh, how to manage applications? Do we need containers? Do we need AB or binary data updates? How to upgrade? Should we do an upgrade over the air? or should we do it uh, using a cable or a USB stick? Although the majority of devices nowadays um, are connected devices, uh, Internet of Things, there are still some use cases where either the device is not connected to a network or you don't have uh, direct physical access to the network. So instead, someone should go physically with a USB stick to the device, plug the USB stick and upgrade it. Um, also, we should consider that some devices have stable internet connection pretty much all the time, but other devices, for example, wearable devices or vehicles are moving and may lose temporarily internet connection. In this case, uh, there should be a mechanism to retry updating it. Another question to, to ask, is the device mission critical? Because very often after an upgrade, a reboot is required and this reboot might have a very negative impact if it's done in a bad moment. More things to, to, to uh, consider about software upgrades are the technologies we are using. Uh, what kind of build system are we going to use? If it's the Octo project, do we have board support packages for it? And so on. Uh, last but not least, how to update a fleet of devices, not just one device, but many devices and some companies uh, have millions of devices to upgrade. In this case, uh, you need um, reliable server software to distribute the upgrades, to make sure that the, these upgrades are applied. If something goes wrong, to try upgrading the device again. There are several uh, different embedded Linux update strategies. All of them are common because depending on the use case, uh, different uh, developers decide a different strategy to use different strategy. First of all, we'll start with the AB updates. In this case, there is a dual rendering scheme with A and B partitions, which are identical. The, the next uh, common strategy are Delta updates. They're interesting because a very small portion only, the binary the, uh, delta of the difference between the old and new version is distributed. This saves bandwidth. Uh, however, uh, it's a little bit tricky if the device is uh, not uh, working properly after the update as the fallback sometimes uh, might not be possible if the device is not even booting after the update. Another strategy which is quite popular and actually is coming from the world 
of servers where containers are extremely popular nowadays. Uh, this is the container-based updates. Last but not least, uh, nowadays we see more and more people um, using the combined strategy where you have a small uh, embedded Linux distribution with AB updates of the base distribution and containers running on top of it. We will uh, discuss this in more details in the slides later on. Let's start with the AB upgrades. Actually, uh, this is the main focus of the presentation. So, so uh, we have a dual AB identical root FS um, partitions, a partition A and partition B. The idea is that the device is running with one of the partitions as active. Uh, when there is an update, the client application, which runs on the embedded device, periodically checks uh, to the server for an update. If there is a new software update available, the client downloads this update, installs it to the B partition, and after that, using the bootloader, it switches to this B partition. If everything is okay, it uses this partition on which we have installed uh, the upgrade. Otherwise, there is a fallback procedure which may return to the other partition, which is known as a good partition and known to work. Um, sometimes having just AB partitions is not enough because uh, the device may need, to, and actually most of the time, needs to store persistent data which is left unchanged during the update uh, process. Because of this, open source um, solutions for the AB upgrades also support as a feature to have a data partition. This data partition is left unchanged when you do updates. It's um, very convenient for storing, for example, configurations which are specific for the device. Let's discuss a little bit more the combined strategy that we had already mentioned. The container technology has changed the way application developers interact with the cloud and some of the good practices are nowadays applied to the development workflow uh, for embedded devices and Internet of Things. Containers make applications faster to deploy, easier to update and more secure through isolation. Uh, furthermore, nowadays, some of the embedded Linux devices are quite powerful. So, um, a lot of companies prefer to have a um, base distribution um, which performs AB updates and on top of it to have um, several containers, um, for example, a dedicated contain container for each application. As you know, application development is quite different from platform development. Uh, so. Uh, in majority of the cases, different teams are developing the applications and the platforms. Uh, application developers are nowadays used to containers because they can have a container only for their application to make sure that this application is isolated from other application and won't interfere with them. This is a good se for security as well. And also application developers can ensure that the container has all dependency their application needs. And, uh, this means that you can perform um, management of the container um, and AB upgrades of the base operating system. Because of this, this combined strategy, it's actually something that I have implemented on several occasions for customers of Consuku Group and is uh, definitely something worth considering for many, many use cases. Let's have a look at the popular open source solutions for updates. We'll start with the two solutions that we will uh, explore in more details in this presentation, Mender and Rauk. Both of them are for AB upgrades. Uh, however, Mender also supports Delta updates. Um, Mender and Rauk are not the only solution for the AB upgrades. SW update is also quite po uh, popular. There are solutions for um, container-based, entirely container-based um, upgrades, such as Balena or Snap. Uh, there's also a whole group of solutions based on um, a project called uh, LibOS3, previously known as OS3, uh, which is doing um, binary delta uh, diffs of the file system and updates through it. Actualizer, Actualizer Lite are applications which interact with LibOS3 to um, manage uh, updates. Um, for several years, as, as part of my work at Consuku Group, uh, we were helping ATS Advanced Telematic Systems 
uh, with the integration of um, OS3 in uh, Yocto Open Embedded layers um, called uh, Meta Updater and their whole uh, solution for uh, binary data updates uh, with ATS Garage. Also, uh, technologies such as Qt OTA and Horizon by Toradex are relying on LibOS3 for doing uh, upgrades over the air with using just binary data. Uh, another important question that we've mentioned is the build framework. So how are you going to build your custom embedded Linux distribution? Uh, nowadays, there are uh, a lot of uh, open source build frameworks that uh, um, do excellent job. Let's start with Yocto and Open Embedded. I've mentioned that I've been using it for uh, maybe seven years now. Um, so this is my preferred choice, but uh, also there are uh, uh, excellent alternative uh, solutions such as Buildroot, PDXDIS, uh, or OpenWRT, which is quite popular specifically for uh, routers. Of course, there are other uh, solutions as well. And I'm sure that someone will ask the question, can I just use Debian? Yes, of course, Debian is a stable uh, full distribution with tens of thousands of packages available as binary files for installation without the need to cross-compile from source. Uh, uh, Debian provides pre-compiled files for most common architectures, including x86-64, ARM, alias RISC-V. There are numerous Debian derivatives um, for embedded devices. Probably the most popular one is the Raspberry Pi OS, which was previously known as Raspbian. I'm also a huge fan of Armbian, uh, uh, which is a distribution, a Debian-based distribution for various um, single board computers, um, popular among makers. Uh, I know the maintainer, Igor, who's doing a great job. Um, the whole topic about using Debian on a better device is a very, very large. Uh, it totally makes sense for makers, for industrial projects, not really, not really. Uh, and uh, Chris Simmons had a great talk a couple of years ago comparing Debian to uh, the Yocto project. I won't go into any details about this because it's a huge topic and we don't have time for it. But if this is something you are interested in, I highly recommend you to have a look at a Chris talk, which is recorded and it's available at YouTube. Now, uh, I've mentioned that I have a lot of experience with the Yocto project. I also have uh, upstream contributions to Buildroot, but Yocto and Open Embedded is my preferred tool for building a Linux distribution. Uh, the Yocto project is a project of the Linux Foundation. It is, um, it is a collaborative project for creating um, a custom Linux-based systems for embedded devices using the Open Embedded build system. Open Embedded Build System includes Bitbake and Open Embedded Core. Pocky is a reference distribution of the Yocto project, provided as metadata without any binary files to bootstrap your own distribution for embedded devices. The Yocto project has a biannual release cycle. Twice a year, there's a new release. And uh, last year, the Yocto project introduced the so-called long-term support LTS releases covering two-year uh, period. The first uh, LTS release is Dunfell. This is version 3.1 of the Yocto project. It was released in April 2020. And I have to say that all the examples in this presentation are based on Dunfell. And in the next slide, I'll explain why this is uh, important. The next release of the Yocto project is scheduled for October, which means uh, next month. And it's gonna be version 3.4 Honister. This release brings a major uh, change in the override syntax of Yocto and Open Embedded. So the, the character that we use will be uh, replaced. Actually, it has been already replaced in all these uh, main branches. And if you want to give it a try, you can try it right now in October with the release of uh, version 3.4, it will be officially available. Uh, the uh, documentation of the Yocto project has been already updated to cover details about this change. Uh, so here you can see an, a very simple example how image install now appends Docker uh, to your image. Uh, this is uh, an example that I've picked up because of the combined strategy that I've mentioned previously. 
if you have already existing layers which are not yet converted uh, to the new syntax, OE Core provides a convenient script which can help you to migrate to the new version. And keep in mind that uh, although this syntax is not available in Dunfeld, the LTS, the current LTS version, uh, it will most probably make it to the next LTS version of the Yocto project. So it's something uh, worth considering. I repeat that this presentation and the examples uh, in the following slides are based on Dunfeld, so we'll be using the old override syntax. Now let's focus on the AB upgrade solutions uh, in more details. First, we're going to start with Mender. Mender is available as free, open source or paid commercial and enterprise uh, plans. AB update schemes are for the open source use for the community uh, and they're available for all plans offered by Mender. There's also a Delta upgrades for professional and enterprise plans uh, uh, in Mender. So although Mender is popular among the community for its AB upgrades, it's technically possible to do Delta updates if you subscribe for a professional or enterprise plan. However, in this presentation, I will focus on the open source features of Mender with AB up updates. Furthermore, Mender provides a backend service. This is the hosted Mender, which you can install on a server to help you manage your embedded devices and their updates. Mender is written in the programming languages Go, Python, and a little bit of JavaScript, of course. Um, can you live without JavaScript nowadays? Uh, the Yocto and Open Embedded integration uh, for Mender is done through the Yocto layer Meta Mender, and there are extra BSP layers for the various supported boards. The source code is available in GitHub under Apache 2 license. Here is a short list of some of the supported Mender devices. These are not all of them, but of course, some of the most popular, starting with Raspberry Pi, my favorite single board computer and probably the most popular single board computer in the world, followed by the open source BeagleBone uh, single board computers. Uh, there is support for Intel x86-64 devices, Rockchip Owinner, NXP IMX6, IMX8, and many more. Uh, to learn actually all the supported devices, have a look at the MetaMender community layer where you can uh, find sub layers for the various supported uh, devices. For example, here we have MetaMender Raspberry Pi. Once again, I repeat, um, the examples here are based on the LTS release um, dumpo of the Yocto project and open embedded. Mender um, AB updates support two client modes. The first one is the managed, which is um, uh, the default uh, client mode. Uh, the client is running as a daemon, pulls from the server for updates. Uh, this is happening automatically. The second option is for standalone updates, which are triggered locally. Um, this is uh, suitable for physical media. Um, uh, for example, if you need to do an update with a USB stick, uh, you can, you can uh, write the um, demander artifact on the USB stick, plug it on the device, and if you have created, of course, previously uh, a UDAF rule, the UDAF rule can trigger, can detect the USB stick and can trigger a script which will um, apply the update using the same steps as explained here. So the first part of this example is that in a local.conf we have to disable uh, the uh, Mender client, which by default is automatically enabled. Then we need to run. Um, this example is for over the year update. Then we need to run a um, uh, simple HTTP script. I'm using Python in, in this case. And um, on the embedded device, we need to run Mender install follow, followed by the URL where you download it. And of course, instead of a URL, if we're doing the example that I've mentioned with a USB stick, instead we should use the path to the uh, file. Uh, now let's have a look at the Mender data partition. Uh, as I said, by default, we have A and B partition, but the information on, on uh, these partitions is wiped out each time when we apply an upgrade. So in order to keep some information uh, persistent through updates, Mender has a specific uh, directory, a whole partition, a data partition, 
uh, it stores persistent data preserved during Mender updates. The Mender client itself, uh, which is running on the embedded devices, uses uh, slash data slash Mender to preserve data and state across updates for its own usage. The size of the data partition is defined by a specific variable introduced by Mender. This is the Mender uh, data part size MB. Uh, which configures the size of the data partition. By default, it is 128 megabytes. However, if this is enabled, Mender feature, uh, um, Mender Grow FS data tries to resize on first boot the remaining uh, free space for the data partition. However, however, keep in mind that Mender Grow FS uh, data relies on systemd grow fs so this is particularly for uh, linux distributions relying on systemd and uh, it is also possible to create an image for the data partition in advance uh, this means uh, that bitbake will produce this uh, data image and um, can you can put it in, uh, out of the box uh, on it some information uh, in order to achieve this, uh, you need to apply the following configuration to image FS. Uh, the, the keyword is data image and the Mender classes will take care of it and BitBake will generate uh, this partition for you. This is particularly uh, useful because sometimes you really need to have uh, something on this data partition as soon as the board boots. Uh, let's have a look uh, at the steps to install Mender update on embedded device. Uh, so first you apply the update, after that uh, you do a reboot. On the first boot, after a successful update, the Mender client will commit the update. Uh, this, this step for committing the update means that it, will verif it verifies that the device has booted successfully, it is working fine, and uh, by doing the commit, you are saving the configuration, meaning that the uh, you are confirming that the update is is successful, and on uh, follow-up boots, this partition will be used. If the commit is not done uh, on the next reboot, the old partition will be um, will be applied. Uh, in uh, in uh, in the setup where you are performing manual uh, upgrades, uh, don't forget to do uh, the Mender commit step on your own. Now, very interesting feature about Mender is the so-called Mender uh, single file um, artifact. Uh, this is a deployment of a single file directory or even uh, a container image. Uh, this is particularly convenient for uh, application updates. Very often people ask, okay, we're doing this AB updates and uh, if we have a big partition, this means that we are downloading uh, the whole partition, which is um, a reasonable file as in terms of the disk size and what happens if we just forget one file or something and the answer is Mender has this feature to deploy a single file you can create a Mender artifact containing this file and apply it as an upgrade however of course the root file system uh, must be read right uh, because uh, later on uh, you see that it's also possible to uh, make these AB partitions uh, read only so yeah, this is, this is an option in Mender, which is quite convenient and covers um, um, some uh, critical use cases by saving you um, the procedure to upgrade, to do a whole system upgrade and instead to deploy a single file. Let's have a look at some of the uh, interesting Mender add-ons. Uh, Mender supports several of them. First of all, Remote Terminal. This is an interactive cell uh, sessions with full terminal emulation. There's also an option for file transfer. This is again an add-on, uh, which as the name suggests, allows you to upload and download files to and from an embedded device on which Mender is working. Another interesting add-on is the port forwarding. Uh, you can forward any local port to a port on a device without opening ports actually on it. Uh, and the Mender configure add-on uh, is for applying configurations to your devices through an uniform interface. So Mender is not just the AB upgrades, but it has all these add-ons. Uh, you have the ability to create your add -on, uh, own add-ons, hooks, and to 
constantly expand the features of Mender. Uh, I know that a lot of um, projects uh, require some uh, specific attention because they have a very, very specific use case. And in um, these use cases, add-ons can be uh, either used, any of these add-ons can be used, or eventually new add-ons can, um, can be developed. In uh, 2018, Mender added support for Intel, Intel and AMD x86-64 machines um, through the group boot folder. Uh, because uh, for uh, OR devices, for the ARM devices, uh, Mender is relying on U-Boot. So for uh, Intel x 8664 um, we have group support. Uh, I have to say that uh, in the embedded world, uh, the majority of the, of the devices as of the moment, based on my experience, are ARM. However, um, Intel also provides, Intel Atom also provides interesting um, um, solutions and um, uh, Kusuku has some customers running um, embedded devices with Intel for which we are using Mender with x86-64 uh, support. Um, we, uh, over time, uh, initially, actually, initially there were some issues which were uh, uh, resolved and nowadays Mender works very, very stable on these devices. Um, here, here is, um, here is a screenshot of a GitHub pull request that uh, I have created to fix uh, Mender initial installation from a USB on machines with BIOS uh, using the same installation script, uh, Mender installation script as for EFI. Um, so uh, the, 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 whole, the whole thing behind this uh, GitHub pull request is that the initial installation of a distribution on um, x86-64 machine is most commonly done using a live image on a USB stick. I mean, the very first time when you populate uh, the, uh, the drive of the machine. Uh, once that's done, once you're ready with the initial installation, you can uh, proceed with AB upgrades, uh, just like as we discussed uh, with, uh, with Mender. Now, let's have a look at the other solution for AB upgrades, which is quite popular. This is, it's called RAUC. Uh, RAUC is a lightweight update client that runs on an embedded Linux device and reliably controls the procedure for updating the device with a new firmware revision. Uh, RAUC supports multiple update scenarios. It provides tools for the build system to create, inspect, and modify update bundles. It uses um, cryptography to sign update bundles. Uh, one of the advantages of RAUG is that it's compatible not only with the Yocto project, with, but also with PDX Dist and Build Root. RAUG is available uh, under um, several different uh, licenses because it has several different components. RAUG itself is uh, all, all of these repositories for RAUG are available at GitHub. There is a RAUG organization. Uh, RAUG itself is available under LGPL license. MetaRAUG, this is the um, Yocto and Open Embedded integration layer for RAUG, is available under an MIT license. Um, RAUG Hogbit um, uh, updater are available uh, also under LGPL uh, licenses. In order to integrate RAUC um, on your embedded device and in your embedded Linux distribution, there are several things that you should do. First of all, you should select an appropriate boot folder. Um, for ARM devices, for example, it's going to be um, U-Boot, and I have created several examples for this uh, using um, different versions of uh, Raspberry Pi single board computers. Next step is to enable SquashFS in the Linux kernel configurations as well as X4 a root file system because RAUG does not have any X2 or X3 file system type support. We need to create um, specific partitions that matches the RAUG slots. Uh, so we need a slot for the A partition, a slot for the B partition, eventually a slot for, um, for the data partition. Uh, the data partition in RAUG is something that we're going to discuss in the next slide, but basically uh, it, it has the same uh, features as um, what we described in Mender. The idea is to have a data partition uh, on which the information is persistent across updates. 
um, the whole per, uh, the whole thing about partitions has to be specified in terms of uh, Yocto and Open Embedded in WKS uh, uh, files. This is the weak uh, Kickstarter file. And uh, the next step is actually the most important and tricky step because um, we need to configure the bootloader environment and create a script to switch between the RAUC slots, to switch between the A and the B slot when uh, there is uh, an update which has been applied. Um, last but not least, and our important step is to create a certificate and a keyring in the ROC system conf file uh, to verify uh, the updates. Uh, security is a very essential part of ROC, and because of this, we need these uh, certificates and keyrings described. Now, let's have a look at the ROC data partition. Um, the interesting thing about ROG is that it supports both single and redundant data partitions. Um, for redundant data partitions, the active rootfs slot has to mount the correct data partition dynamically, uh, for example, using udef root. Uh, this makes it a little bit tricky. Uh, this, uh, this means that you have an A partition and B partition for the rootfs, and you also have an A and B partitions for the data, so the rootfs should be taking care about switching between them. Honestly, um, my preferred choice is to stay with a single data partition. This makes things easier, and on the data partition, you can store valuable information which should be um, should remain on the device um, between uh, updates. Last year, in 2020, I did uh, my contribution to MetaRauk by creating a layer called MetaRauk Community. The idea of this layer is to um, provide examples how to integrate Rauk on various machines. On the previous slide, I showed you the list of steps, and there are so many steps that you should do in order to integrate Rauk. So if you have an example, it's always easier to get started. And of course, uh, the obvious choice for this first example was to use a Raspberry Pi. So I started this in 2020. I wrote um, a blog post which was um, posted on uh, kunsuku.com. After that, I had a talk about it. So please have a look at this talk if you want to learn more details about, about MetaRock community. And for more, my surprise, a lot of people were interested in this um, layer. There were so many contributions. Nowadays, there are uh, several active contributions. Uh, in, uh, we have a branch for Dunfell, but we also have a main branch which is uh, following the um, recent changes in uh, Yocto Project and Open Embedded, including uh, recently um, there was a GitHub pull request for um, fixing the new override syntax introduced with the new releases of Yocto. Um, also, uh, this year, this summer, we moved the RAUC uh, MetaRauk community to the Rauk organization in GitHub, so now you can find it in one place. Keep in mind that MetaRauk community is something um, for providing examples. It's uh, something that helps you get started more easily and faster. The great news, again, for, uh, coming from this summer is that a contributor was kind enough to provide support for Rauk um, uh, on all winner devices, also known as Sungsi devices, uh, through the um, BSP layer Meta Sungsi. Of course, for Raspberry Pi, we are using Meta Raspberry Pi. So if you are using Krauk on a device which is not currently supported in Meta Rauk community, uh, please uh, consider contributing an example for the device. And uh, contributions are always welcome. The source code is in GitHub and GitHub pull requests are welcome. Keep in mind that Oktoberfest is coming, so um, it's a good, uh, good time for making GitHub pull requests. Now, let's have a, a quick look at a RAUC example for Raspberry Pi 4. Um, as I said, uh, the majority of the, actually all of the integration steps that I've described previously are already done in this MetaRAUC community layer that we have for um, Meta, uh, Raspberry Pi. So MetaRAUC community inside has a number of sub-layers and there's a one sub-layer called MetaRAUC Raspberry Pi. Uh, we need to add all these layers to the BB layers of our build and then in loco.conf we have to spe um, specify the machine. Here I'm uh, using systemd 
uh, I'm adding rock to the image x4 for the file system type as I explained that um, uh, rock requires x4 and I'm switching to U-Boot. By default, uh, Meta Raspberry Pi is using the uh, standard Raspberry Pi bootloader, but uh, in our case, we need U-Boot because I have implemented a script which switches between the partition, the AB partitions, uh, and Rock relies on the script. And we have uh, the w, uh, Kickstarter WKS file, uh, which is, has been specifically created for the dual partition scheme for Rock on Raspberry Pi. So once that this is done on the um, and we can build an build an image for example um, core image uh, base uh, boot it on the system then we can build an uh, an update bundle the um, the recipe for uh, building uh, the update build uh, update bundle is also available in uh, MetaRock community and here is an example uh, how to perform um, manual RAUC update on the Raspberry Pi. Here uh, you can see how the bootloader works. Initially, after the first installation, the A partition will be uh, will be active. When we execute rock install, uh, the uh, rock will install the downloaded file to the B partition, and finally uh, we will do a reboot. So rock uh, will take with uh, with the assistance of uh, U-boot will take care. To, um, to select the B partition and if everything is okay, our device will boot from the B partition. Uh, one more thing about uh, valid for both um, both RAUC and Mender is read-only file system. Uh, this is something uh, that's not specific for the um, AB update mechanism that you're using, but instead it's something specific for the Yocto project and Open Embedded. There are two options how to create a read-only file system uh, using Bitbake. Uh, the first option, if you have your own image, which is the recommended way, of course, is just to add to its uh, image features the root-only rootfs, as uh, as shown here. Alter alternatively, uh, for example, if you just um, if you're just debugging and want to do it quickly through local.conf, you can use extra image features and again add uh, the read-only rootfs. This is described in more details in the uh, documentation of the Yopto project and Open Embedded. Beware uh, that um, there might be packages in the image that expect the root file system to be uh, uh, writable and might not function properly. So. Uh, why is this happening? Well, basically, um, as, an, uh, as a very active uh, contributor to Meta Open Embedded, I have to uh, say that when I do uh, an update for it, uh, uh, when I prepare a patch for the upstream of Meta Open Embedded, I do proper testing on um, uh, read-write uh, rootfs. And uh, certain applications, uh, which are um, wrapped as recipes require on the fly after, for example, after the first boot of the device to create certain files. So if the system is read-only, they will not be able to create these files. And uh, there, are, there are different solutions to this problem if you run it into it and if you want to have a read-only root file system for uh, your AB updates. One solution is to move these files and directories to the data partition. This is a solution that I actually like because most probably uh, you want to keep these um, these files and directories persistence across updates uh, because if, if there is something, if there are any user specific configurations, you don't want to lose them. Another solution is to use uh, overlays. And um, something that's Again, interesting and can be applied for both Mender and Traug is a combined strategy with containers. So there is a uh, Yocto and Open Embedded layer called Meta Virtualization. It provides support for building SAN, KVM, LibVirt, of course, Docker, and all associated packages necessary for, for constructing an oil based virtualized solution. In other words, the dependencies of uh, these technologies. In order to use Meta Virtualization, of course, you have to add it to your BB layers, but also you have to add to your distro features virtualization. Um, if you have your own distro, you can uh, 
uh, do it there. Alternatively, if you are uh, looking for a quick solution, you can just add with append uh, the virtualization to the distro features in local.conf. Um, so once you have um, the layer and the virtualization distro feature enabled, you can uh, install to the image, for example, Docker and run Bitbake to build it. Um, so the idea here is that there are use cases uh, on powerful embedded devices where um, con uh, containers are combined with AB upgrades uh, of the base um, Linux distribution uh, built with uh, Yocto and Open Embedded. So uh, meta virtualization is your friend if you're looking for such kind of a solution. So let's wrap it up with some conclusions. Obviously, there are numerous things to consider when implementing an upgrade mechanism uh, for an embedded device. There are many open source uh, software solutions, and I highly encourage you to use one of them. I know that a lot of companies and developers think, uh, hey, we're so special that uh, there's nothing out there that can help us. Um, even if this is true, keep in mind that you can take uh, an existing open source solution and add only the features that are missing there for your particular um, use cases. And based uh, on my experience, I have to say you to say that um, things like Mender and Rauk have quite a lot of solutions and they're covering quite a lot of use cases. So most probably for the majority of use cases that you have, they already have a solution. Um, Mender and Rauk are very powerful and good solutions for AB upgrades. Uh, they have excellent integration for Yocto and Open Embedded. Furthermore, Mender also has integration for Debian and Rao has integration for various other alternative build frameworks. Uh, combined strategies for AB upgrades with containers um, are becoming more and more popular. Uh, they have a lot of um, advantages, not only because of the uh, isolation of the application, which is good from security point of view, but also because application developers can have better control of the dependencies and uh, the container images. Uh, Real-world implementations of AB upgrades very often require a data partition for storing any persistent data which is left unchanged during the update process. Honestly, all the implementations that I have created for AB upgrade included such a data partition. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this talk. Here are some useful links and let me know if you have any questions.